You know, we've just spent 40 minutes proclaiming Jesus, a name that most of us are very familiar with. Even people in the world use that name wrongly, but they use it. But there are parts of the world where that name has never been heard once. Isn't that amazing? And so the Alliance uh, has a big heart for that. And as is our tradition, uh, we, in the month of October, around Thanksgiving, we want to open up our purses for the king and for the kingdom so that we can advance the cause of the gospel. In parts of the world, just, just don't have that. And we call that the Jaffrey offering. And so we are asking you to prayerfully consider what you can give so that these young men and young women who are being sent out in their homelands can be reached with the gospel. And so this morning and also next morning, uh, next Sunday, we're, all, we're gonna have these brief videos, these two minute videos that describe for you what the Jaffrey offering is and what it's about so that you will know what you're giving towards. And then specifically next week, we'll have a very specific video about what this year's theme is. And I'm so excited for it. They are gathering young men and women in villages across Southeast Asia who have heard the gospel, responded, and want to be church planters. And so they are going to provide training for them so they can go out and they can start new churches in places where there are none. Isn't that exciting? And we can have a part of that. So that will be more detailed next week, but this week is kind of the big picture, what the Alliance is doing. So I'm just going to encourage us to listen for a couple minutes. Thank you for supporting the Jaffrey Project, our annual missions focus. It's an opportunity to raise significant funding that goes to the places of greatest need. Your generous giving and prayerful support enables us to bring access to Jesus where few or none have heard. Thanks to your generous giving in 2021, we raised $454,901. This puts your total donations to the Jaffrey Project at over $2.3 million in the last six years, and that's incredible. We praise God that through your spirit of generosity and prayerful engagement, lives have been impacted with the love of Jesus. I wanna take a moment to share two ways that this funding is impacting people. In a Southeast Asian country, one of our international workers leads a drop-in English education program for Rohingya young men living under challenging circumstances. This program creates opportunities to hear about the hope Jesus offers through education and mentorship. Meanwhile, in an African country, we have an international worker leading a village savings and loans project that assists the women of 10 villages to become self-sufficient by learning about and, and implementing a group savings program. Our international workers are able to run projects and programs like these because of your prayers and financial support. We celebrate each opportunity we have to see God transform lives. This is what the Alliance is all about. We are passionate about sharing the hope found in Jesus to people and places that have never heard about who God is. Thank you for joining us and making a difference around the world. We ask that you continue to pray for the projects, programs, and opportunities our international workers are a part of. We are excited for all that 2022 holds and how God will continue to work in and through the Alliance as we share about Him in places like South Asia, North Africa, Senegal, and to the places and people where the Spirit of God leads us. So over the next few weeks, uh, I think we'll probably brought to close the first Sunday of November. Uh, if you want to give towards that, just mark it clearly on the envelope so that it goes to the Jaffrey Project. And then we'll be collecting all that up. And then on sometime after November 6th, we'll send it in to the national office and be part of the big crowd collecting all the other Alliance churches. And I think we just need to spend a moment in prayer for this. And, and trust God for it. So Jesus, we just offer our wealth. We have so much. And Father, we pray that you would help us to consider carefully and prayerfully what you would have us do 
to see the name of Jesus go into places that have never heard it before. So we thank you for this golden opportunity to, be part, to participate together with many others who are of like mind to see Jesus glorified in the darkest places. And so we ask for this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, we were going to have uh, an I Met Jesus video, but I think in the interest of time this morning, we're going to have that next week. So we'll have that shared with us next week. Thank you, Dave, for leading us this morning and starting off the service. And thank you, Mary Jean, for reminding him. <laughs> that was so important. Dave is one of our elders in our church, and, uh, and he and Mary Jean have been part of our leadership for many years before I got here. And he is also our treasurer. So thank, for, thank you for all that you do for our church. Let's say thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this morning, we want to carry on in our series about what really matters. Why we have church. What, do we, what are we doing here? What's the point of all of this? And so we've had several messages that have found their framework out of pa the passages found in Acts chapter 2. And verse 42, where it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread, and to prayer. And this morning, we're going to focus in on that last aspect, prayer. I think it's, it's beautiful how it coincides with sort of a renewed or revived vision of praying together for this evening at 6. I just think it's wonderful. And I pray that God will bless us as we hear this today. I have been so eager to preach this. It has been so refreshing to my soul to go through this material and now to be able to present it to you. Obviously, prayer is a massive subject, right? And most of us feel guilty. Anybody here not feel guilty about how much they don't pray? <laughs> you know, prayer is just one of those things, right? It can be easily shoved aside by busyness, tiredness, your phone, TV, you can be so distracted by so many things that keep us from prayer. But it is such a vital part of our Christianity and our Christian walk. And as you can see here in this passage, after the church was birthed by the Holy Spirit, they were eager and devoted themselves steadfastly to prayer. So what does that look like for us today? I want to just focus in I mean, we could go so many places. We could do a whole series on the, on the idea of prayer, but we're not going to do that this morning. We're just going to focus in on one vital part, and that is how prayer is vital to community. Okay? How prayer is vital to community, to our church, to fellowship, to teaching, to breaking bread. How prayer is vital. They devoted themselves to prayer. And you'll notice that it's not different from the other things. It's listed right with the same list as teaching. It's listed with fellowship. It's listed with taking communion together, breaking bread together. It's listed as one of those four main pillars of what really matters in the church. So my question to me and to us today from the scripture is, does prayer receive the equal emphasis it deserves in our modern church? Does it? Hmm. It's worth thinking about. It's worth going through this to inspire us. My hope and prayer for this message has not been to make you feel worse about your prayer life. My hope is that it will inspire you to dig deeper, to set goals for your prayer life. I don't know if any of you have ever done that. I know a couple times in my life I have set goals for my prayer life, and it has been exciting, and I don't know why I fail to do it more often. Because when you set goals for your prayer life, God is honored. He is going to meet you in your prayers. And he is going to meet us in our prayers. And so that's the aspect that I want to focus in on today from the scriptures. Dallas Willard, one of my favorite authors, if you ever get a chance to read anything he's written, he is so precise and just a lover of Christ, a lover of the church. 
and a lover of the scriptures. He says, this he calls a community of prayerful love. Doesn't that sound good? A community of prayerful love. Just say that with me. A community of faith, prayerful love. Prayerful love. You can say it that way. Jesus Christ is who makes us a community. Did you realize that? Like this morning, we worshiped. We brought him into the center. Like tangibly, here we are. Now we're looking at the word. The word brings him into the center, tangibly. When we pray, we bring him into our midst tangibly. He's already there. We're just recognizing it. When we have communion and we worship him this way and we remember him and what he did on the cross and his resurrection. It's so important for us to do these things because Jesus is why we have church. When we're instructed, we are instructed by Jesus' teachings. When we come into fellowship, we come into fellowship through faith in Jesus Christ. When we have communion, he is honored. He's the center of what he's done for us. And when we pray, we ask everything to be done in Jesus' name. It's Christ that makes us who we are. And it's Christ that enables us to be Christ-like to each other through, you say it, prayer. Come on, say it with me. Prayer. Hmm. So I want to give you a crash course. This is what I give to all couples who come for premarital counseling or for marriage counseling. I take them through a study in the book of Matthew chapter 7. And this study is helpful because it gives us a framework for good communication and for prayer for each other. And so when we have our time together, I just want you to open your Bibles and look at Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 1. It's just going to be a quick one. I'm not going to go through the detail that I would go through in a counseling session, but it's going to give you the idea. It's going to give you the bullet points. So Matthew chapter 7, he starts out by saying, do not Judge. Now that word has been well overused and underappreciated. You do have to make judgment calls, right? In life. But to judge another is to unfairly criticize or to hold them in condemnation. It's to see yourself as better than, as more important than, with more authority than, with more experience than. It puts you above the other. And Jesus says, strictly, don't do that. Because you also will be treated the same way. Don't judge, or you too will be judged. You'll be harshly criticized. You'll be condemned in the relationships that you're trying to establish. So that's a terrible way to start. We'd say, that's kind of starting a relationship off on the wrong foot. Wouldn't you say that? But in the midst of relationships, that's where it gets tough. Because as we get to know each other, we get to know some of the foibles and the craziness that some of us are into and do and say and think and act on. And you know what we think? We think better of ourselves. And you know, I should tell so-and-so. They shouldn't be doing that. And we have in our hearts something that's not healthy. It will not bring the change we desire. It may just be pushed back. And how does that help the body? How? Well, he goes on to say, for in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. With the measure you used, it will be measured back to you. So if I get up in your grill and I start going after you about something, there's no reason why you wouldn't do the same to me. And then where are we at? We're nowhere. He keeps going. It all starts in the attitude of the heart towards others. Why, he says in verse 3, do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. I think he's trying to bring some old Jewish Hebrew uh, humor into the situation, right? You can envision it. Some guy trying to help somebody else but keeps hitting with the plank in his own eye. Well, he's trying to pick out the sawdust from the other person's eye. It's humorous, but it's very pointed. What he's trying to say It's okay to try and help, 
But here's what he says, you hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So deal with you in the situation before you try to deal with them in the situation. That's what it's about. He says, deal with yourself first. Break it down. Don't be hypocritical. As soon as you start to think that way, you begin to realize that you don't have all things together. That you're not perfect and that your opinions are not always right. Contrary to your belief. He calls that hypocrisy. We need to ask ourselves, how am I contributing to this problem? How am I coming off as hypocritical? Why do I think I have it together and they don't? It's very important that we think through these things before we open this thing right here. Okay. I love this one. This is great. This one always stumps everybody I'm with. Then he says in verse 6, do not give dogs what is sacred. And don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. What does that mean? <laughs> that's some really good Hebrew idiom. That's, that's like a saying. But basically, it's fairly easy to figure out. You can be right as rain. You can even have 10 Bible verses to back you up. But if you come across to that person as judgmental, or having not dealt with your own stuff first, it'll be like casting something sacred to a dog. It just won't work. In fact, if you keep doing that, they're going to turn on you. That's what's going to happen, according to Jesus. And so as we look at this, we must be careful about what we say to each other. Before you try to forcefully push your opinion or your thoughts or even your Bible verse, before you try to forcefully do that, stop. Ask the Spirit of God, should I say this? Is this the right thing to do right here, right now? In this place, at this time? And I'm saying that not because I think it's, you know, good sort of relationship counseling. It's good because Jesus said we should. Because that's how Jesus lived his life. We'll get to that in a second. Let's keep going. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and him who knocks, the door will be opened. This is Jesus saying, in your relationships, be curious. Be curious. Why? Ask plenty of why questions. Why do you think that's important? Why do you think you should do that? Why do you think the situation is okay when Jesus clearly says it isn't? Why? Ask questions. This is the language of the kingdom of God. Seek and be intuitive. This opens up your ears and closes your mouth, which James says, is a restless evil. Wow. I need, we need, to open up our ears twice as much. See, there's two of them, and there's only one of these. Twice as much as we speak. You see that, how God has designed our face symmetrically like that? Be intuitive, be able to listen, seek to listen. Knock, be curious. You see, the language of the kingdom of God is the language of request. Requesting puts the other person in the driver's seat in the conversation. It gives opportunity for you to listen and learn. And watch as the door opens up to go a little deeper. Amen? This is what Jesus is teaching. This is how relationships work. And if you get stuck, this is where it turns to prayer. He says in verse 9, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Come on. Right? He's bringing back some humor. He's trying to make a point. One of the best ways to teach, by the way, is with a little laughter. Because it helps bring the point across. And so he's, you know, which one of you would give your son a scorpion, you know, or, or give him something that's going to hurt him? A stone, a fish. He comes for a fish. Here, have a snake instead. He says this, though, in verse 11. Carefully listen. If you then... Though you are evil, 
if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? That's the key. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? Prayer. Prayer. Do you want better relationships? Close this, open this, and ask God. Ask God. Right? Very helpful. Good gifts, one author said, are spiritual blessings. Grace, wisdom, joy, peace, power, holiness. God wants to pour out these good gifts upon you. How much more? How much more? We can still do good things, right? We can still get good things done. But how much more does our Father want to pour out good things in your relationships? I'm thinking, yes, Lord. Anybody say amen? Yes, Lord. Hmm. So as we enter into the community of prayerful love, what could that that look like here at Hinton Alliance Church? Well, again, we have great examples We have some great examples of what prayer together looks like. In fact, before the Holy Spirit came and birthed the church, Jesus told them to wait. And so they were in an upper room waiting, and this is what it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These were all of one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer. That word continually means to persist obstinately. Persist obstinately in prayer. Now, I've been accused of being obstinate many times. Another fancy word for stubborn refusal to let something go, dog with a bone kind of thing. That's what it was like in these prayer times. They were ferociously seeking God together. Why? Because what do we do now? What do we do next? Direction, help us know. Acts chapter 1, verse 23, they had to replace Judas who betrayed Jesus. So what do we do? Well, Lord, you know the hearts of everybody. Show us who you would have us choose. Looking for direction from God for leadership placement. That's important. Acts chapter 4, they've been persecuted because they were out teaching the good news of Jesus to everybody. And anyone who would listen, they were in the temple courts and they got arrested and thrown in prison. And upon their release, it says in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John went back to their own people. I love that. Their own people? Who were their own people? Well, it was the church. And reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And I don't have time today to go through that prayer. That's a powerful prayer. But at the end, it says in verse 31... And after they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, earthquake in style. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Hallelujah. Corporate prayer is very important. A dispute rose up in the early church between the Greek widows and the Hebrew widows. And the Greek widows figured somehow that the Hebrew widows were getting more of the food than they were. They were being shown favoritism. Why? Well, maybe because they were Hebrews, so it's a bit of racism, and there's all kinds of stuff meddled in there. What did they do? They went to the elders, the apostles, and the apostle says, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom and turn this responsibility over to them. We'll give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then they did this, and then they presented these twelve or uh, uh, seven men to the apostles who prayed over them, who prayed over them, who commissioned them to what? Serve food really well for the kingdom. Make sure nobody feels like they're second class in God's church. Amen. Amen. That took prayer. So prayer, as we can see, I mean, I'm not going to give you all these experiences. Just go through the book of Acts yourself and and read all the times that they were in prayer. But prayer had to be regular. 
It was a regular thing. It was daily. It was as needed. It was wherever and whenever. And they devoted themselves to it, individually, in twos, in homes, in large groups, just as the Scripture clearly says that in order to be a community of prayerful love, you must pray continually. He, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray continually. Ephesians 6 says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, always keep on praying for all the saints. Do you think it's something we should just kind of go, oh, well, if I get to come, I get to come. No. This is devotion. Just as you're devoted to hearing God's word preached, just as you're devoted to singing the praise and the worship of the king, just as you're devoted to fellowship, to coming together, we need to be devoted to prayer, amen? Because that's what makes it work. That's what makes it all work. Jesus was a man of prayer. It says in Luke chapter 5 that he would often withdraw himself to a lonely place and pray. Isn't that exciting? He showed us how to do it. Often withdrawing to a lonely place so he could pray. He devoted an entire night of prayer. An entire night. How? How do you do that? I don't know how to do that. But he devoted an entire night of prayer before he selected his 12 disciples. You see, Jesus knew that we have to be connected to the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we said, we sung, we believe in. And Jesus knew this, and so he abided with his Father closely, constantly. And Jesus looked at us and said, you know, abide in me as I abide in you. Spend time in prayer. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit unless it's attached to the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. If you want to change your life, You abide in Christ, you pray, you spend time in his presence, you commune with him by yourself and together. I'm the vine, you are the branches, branches, plural. We're all a good looking bunch of branches here today, hey? And sometimes we bark at each other and we shouldn't. (laughs) Bad dad joke. (laughs) I had to throw it in there though, just couldn't resist. I'm the vine, singular. You are the branches, plural. All of us need to find our life together in him. Those who abide in me and I in them will bear much fruit because apart from me, you can't do this. You can't be the church apart from me. You can call yourself a church, but you can't be the church apart from abiding in Christ I love this. This is good teaching. Jesus was very careful about every single word that came out of his mouth. How do we know this? He was careful about every single thing he did, every single place he went. How do we know this? Because he told us and he showed us. Listen to what it says in John 5. He said to them, I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. What? What? Did you just hear that? Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could do nothing by himself. (laughs) They got it. (laughs) He can do only, only, only what he sees the Father doing first. Because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he wants him to do. Doesn't that sound like good communion? Doesn't that sound like the perfect Holy Trinity getting along so well and making us aware of what can happen in communion of prayerful love? Hello? Well, what did Jesus do? Well, Acts chapter 10 lays it out clearly in a great summary. I tell you, Jesus, or sorry, uh, we're in my, there's my scripture. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went around doing good 
and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So he only did what the Father told him to do, and from our perspective looking in, he only did good things to people, only. Anybody want to get in that line? Only me? Oh, I see a hand, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see, I can see. You see, that's what it takes. It takes an awareness of Christ in the midst to do this. Listen to what John 12 says. I do not speak on my own accord. Jesus, the Son of God, did not speak because he felt like speaking, because he wanted to say something so bad. He didn't do that. He didn't give instruction. What did he do? Here's what it says. But the Father who sent me commanded me what to say, hallelujah, and how to say it, hallelujah. Sometimes we're really good at what to say, not so good at how to say it. How do we do that? How do we get that corrected? How? You tell me. Prayer. Abiding in Christ together. Hmm. I know that his commands lead to life. If you want life to be a part of every relationship you have, then this is how you do it. He shows us here. He brings life. For I just, I say just what the Father tells me to say. That's communion. That's community. That's a communion of prayerful love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being demonstrated for us as body of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we are baptized into when we believe. Hallelujah. You can see why I was so excited to preach this because it's like a pathway on how to have an amazing church. What do you think? It's a pathway. If we seek it together, if we go after this like the early church devoted themselves to prayer, we will find that our relationships together will become powerful relationships together in the Holy Spirit. That's what will happen. Another one of my heroes that I looked up for this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a pastor in Germany during Hitler's time. He was arrested, put in jail, and died a week before the wars were over. He passed. He was martyred. This is what he says. Listen to carefully what he says. This is, in his, this is in his book, Life Together. He's talking about the church. Therefore, Christ, who indwells us, also stands between us. I like that. I like that. When I approach you, Yulia... Jesus is here. He's between us. When I approach you, when I approach you, when you approach me in Christ, in communion, in community rather, Jesus is between us. He's in us, yes, by his spirit, but he's also between us. So what does that mean? He goes on to say, this means that I must release the other person from my attempt to show my love for them through regulating their activity, coercing them, or trying to dominate them with my love. Wow. This man learned this in the trenches, in the prison, being persecuted. This is how he learned this. It means I must release the other people around me from every attempt of mine to get my point across, to regulate their activities, to coerce them into something, to dominate them with my quote-unquote love. Huh. Well, he goes on to say more. And this was, I mean, I put the book down after this. said, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me for trying to be crafty with my words for trying to dominate someone else with my words, trying to coerce someone else to do what I think they should do, even if I've got 20 scriptures to back me up, if I come through without the Spirit of God first opening the doors, I'm just going to be knocking on wood. It's a waste of time and hard on relationships. 
In other words, this spirit of love will speak to Christ about the other person more than the person will speak to them about Christ. I will speak to Christ more than I will speak to you about him on your behalf. Isn't that good? Somebody's got to say amen or I'm going to go through the roof here. Okay? This is, this is the community of prayer for love that we long for, that we desire for, that we so need. We must train ourselves to see Jesus in the midst of us collectively, but also individually, that he stands between us, governing our fellowship through governing our attitudes and words towards each other, prompting us to ask first so I can listen first, so that I can pray to Jesus first before I open my loud mouth, schnookiness. You don't know what that word means, do you? <laughs> Probably most of us don't know what that word means, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my dad used to have a saying, he's a loudmouth schnook. Yeah, that's where it comes from. Don't ask me to interpret, I just know it wasn't good. <laughs> when addressing any brother or sister in a small group or in person or in together, it is incumbent upon us. It means it's, it's very important to us to follow Jesus' advice and his example in holy community of prayerful love. That's really important. The world will know that Jesus is real by our love for one another. Come on, somebody help me out here. I'm starving for a couple of amens in this one. Here, here's, a, here's a good example of, of Matthew chapter 7 and kind of weaving these stories together. Listen to this. this is, I, I still marvel at this passage, and I know I haven't scratched the surface. There's so much here. But you know that Jesus was on his way to trial. He was on, it was his last day. And um, he told his disciples that he was going to be you know, killed. He was going to be taken away, and the uh, chief priests were going to beat him and all the rest of it. And Peter says, oh, no. That, that wouldn't happen to you. You're, you're, like, you're like the king. Nobody's going to do that to you. And Jesus said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Remember that? Right? You have the things of man in mind. Do you think they were bad things? Peter didn't want to see Jesus getting beaten and killed. You think that's bad? Hello? No, but they weren't what God has in mind. You see, when we pray... For one another first. Sometimes we're surprised before we open our mouth that the Holy Spirit doesn't actually want us to say anything to them, but he is screaming at me from the inside, change your attitude. Anybody ever had that? This is what it's about. And I love how the story goes. And if you follow it in Luke 22, he says to Peter, he calls him Simon, Simon, which was which was a, a, a term of endearment. So he's trying to get us to Simon, Simon, Simon. You know, when you say it twice, right? Kevin, 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 Kevin Cecil. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. The only way you would know that is if in prayer, God the Spirit revealed it to you. Amen? So here he was. Something had been revealed to him about Simon. Now, if you were in prayer for another brother or sister, and this was revealed to you, what would you do? What would you do? Well, let's read what Jesus did, and then we'll compare. How's that sound? Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, to, to hurt you, to crush you. That's what he's asked. But I've prayed for you. Isn't that beautiful? I have prayed for you, Simon. 
that your faith will not fail. And when you've turned back, I love that. When you've turned back, there's a promise in there. When you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Now this, let's unpackage. This is so good. I was vibrating. I just needed to get here and tell you this. Okay. How we would normally handle, or I'm thinking of myself, but probably most of us. Uh, we would try to warn Peter about going into the town square, wouldn't we? If the Holy Spirit came to us and told us what was going to happen, we'd say, don't go. Don't go down there. If you go down there, it's going to be bad. Don't do it. Right? That's probably what we would do. But did Jesus do that? Nope. Hmm. Would we try to persuade him through a really healthy pep talk to stand firm? You're going to see it. You're going to make it through. Well, we might. Jesus didn't. He just said, I pray for you. I know some of us would definitely pray against the enemy, right? Oh, Lord, we stand against the enemy and his plots against the people of God. Jesus didn't. Isn't that something? Hello? This is Jesus showing us how to be a community of prayerful love. You know what that means? Here's what it means. It means that instead of, instead of trying to coerce Peter into not abandoning him, instead, he wanted Peter to know that he prayed for him that his faith will not falter. Wow. Somebody's got to say wow. Because that is community of prayerful love. Real love. You know why? Because Jesus even says... Whether you fail or whether you succeed in this testing, it doesn't matter because in the end, I've prayed for you that you'll turn around and you'll use this experience to encourage other people. Wow. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit wants us to go through the darkest night of the soul. And even if we fail and falter like... Like who? Like Peter. God will go on to use us and to use that failure in faith to inspire the church. You read his books. You read 1 Peter, 2 Peter. What are they all about? Suffering, trials, and coming out glorious before God. So, so dear people of God in Kevin Nickel. When we go to pray, remember Jesus stands in the midst of us and between us. And pray, Holy Spirit, what is it you want me to pray? I know what I want to pray. I want to pray a whole lot of good things. And they may be what the Holy Spirit wants you to pray. But listen, ask questions. Use these twice as much as you use this before the Lord. He uses no condemnation of Peter. Peter, you're going to blow it. I just know it. No. I've prayed that your faith will stand. He uses no shame. Remember afterwards, he calls Peter to him, and they have breakfast together, and he challenges Peter three times. Why three? Why three? Because he denied him three times. And he kept saying, do you love me? Do you love me? And finally he said, do you love me? Even as a friend, do you love me? And Peter was hurt, it says, by that. But Jesus said, go and tell my sheep this. Go and feed my lambs this. Go look after my church with this. That we are broken and we will fail one another. But in Jesus and through the prayerful love of community. We can be restored and God, hallelujah, can use this for his kingdom's sake and for his glory and people will come to know Jesus deeper and come to know him for the first time because we have love one for another like this. Well, what do you think? You say, oh, pastor, I think you're making too much out of that. Really? 
Really? You know, in James, it says that you quarrel, that you have discord, and you have strife. And you have fighting between you. Why? Why? Because of your selfish ambitions. And you know what the cure is? He says, when you ask, or so you have this because you don't ask. And even when you do ask, you ask for yourself in the midst of it. You see, prayerful love prays for the other, recognizing that Jesus stands between us. In the next chapter of James, he says, it is the time for us to confess our sins to each other. Pray for one another so that you can find healing. Isn't that good? So yes, without prayer, there's going to be quarreling and fighting and differing opinions and blah, blah, blah. Everybody's right and the other guy's wrong. We all know that. That's how the rest of the world works. But in Christ, we confess our sins to each other. Pray for one another that you will be healed. Hallelujah. Well, that's it. I'm going to stop, except for this last statement. What really matters at Hinton Alliance Church is that we pursue God with all our hearts concerning this matter and believe by faith he will reward our earnest seeking with joy that comes from being part of a community of prayerful love. In Jesus' name, make this so in our midst. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us for not listening, being curious, seeking, knocking, asking. Forgive us for wanting our own thoughts, our own opinions to have the sway of the day. When really, it's not about that at all. It's not about me. It's about Christ who stands between us and in the midst of us. In Jesus' name.